Yes. Hello, everybody. We would like to start. Can everybody hear me right now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. So we will start. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome uh, to our second pharmaceutical mini academy, this time titled Changes in Business Structure in Licensing. Um, before we start, just want to introduce uh, who is on. So uh, we have uh, this, well, <coughs> sorry, this webinar is prepared and hosted by Transfer Pricing Associates, which is an independent professional services which provides solutions, as you can see, for transfer pricing, mainly transfer pricing, valuation, customs, and uh, such uh, stuff. Uh, we have a vast global network covering over 50 countries. Now it's an, even more. We'll update it on the <coughs> next uh, webinar. So we are a global group, independent, specializing in transfer pricing, and also in several and many industries. Um, Barsvin Bendov is the Israeli Alliance of Transfer Pricing uh, Associates uh, and also the, the partner with Transfer Pricing Associates of the new Transfer Pricing Associate NYC based in uh, Manhattan, um, <clears throat> which provides every transfer pricing matter that you need both in the state, in Israel, and of course with Alliance of Transfer Pricing uh, um, Associates all over the world. Um, Generally speaking, uh, we in Israel have consulted many pharmaceutical companies globally around the world, in Europe, of course, uh, which, uh, and also, uh, of course, in Israel. So from Transfer Pricing Associates, I'm honored to have Mr. Stief Heuberger, the CEO and expert in pharmaceutical and transfer pricing for Transfer Pricing Associates, and also uh, Johanna, uh, which is also an expert in uh, pharmaceutical from uh, Transfer Pricing Associate, and I am from uh, uh, the Varsity and Bender of the TPA in Israel and the United States in New York, <clears throat> and I will uh, do the webinar. So again, thank you, and, uh, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, one last technical issue before we start. Uh, as you can see at the, you know, the top of your screen, when you're seeing Viewing Transfer Pricing Associate, you can always press that button, and then uh, you can press chat. Uh, and, and during, this is a live demonstration. This is a live webinar, actually. It's a live event. So during this uh, web event, you can always uh, press chat and ask questions. You can direct them uh, to Transfer Pricing Associate, to me, to everybody, and we will answer uh, those questions uh, uh, as soon as uh, possible. Okay, so uh, before we start uh, this uh, slide, which is called Intro in Industry Trends, I just want to remind you that this is the second webinar. The first uh, webinar uh, was about the pharmaceutical patent cliff, and this is the second webinar. <coughs> All of them are part of a series of webinars which dedicated uh, to the pharmaceutical industry and talks about uh, uh, consequences and threat risks and all new innovation and things like that, but especially, of course, in the transfer pricing aspect. So the first webinar was about the patent cliff. Uh, this webinar, which we're going to start uh, in a couple of uh, minutes, uh, talking about structuring in licensed IPR, which is connected 100% to those patent cliff. And later on, and we will send everybody uh, messages and really recommend to participate, we'll talk about how to address biosimilars and also how can you leverage from a purchase price allocation for pricing purposes. And we end this academy next year <coughs> with topic number five, which is uh, how to analyze the economics of pipelines in the pharmaceutical industry. And then we will uh, uh, measure two uh, uh, valuation methods from DCF to real option valuation methods. This is very important, very new, and I really recommend to participate. So in the last webinar, we were talking about the patent cliff and we saw all the threats and all the challenges that pharmaceutical companies are facing today. If you remember, who, you know, if you participate in the first webinar, if not, you probably uh, can get into uh, our website and get all the information from then or ask that for us. We will give it to you, of course. Uh, so, you know, we heard news like Merck, for example, has been grappling with the loss of exclusivity for a blockbuster drug, uh, which cost her uh, more than $5 billion in annual peak sales. And also AstraZeneca and a lot of major companies uh, today 
uh, are threatening, lose of patents to their generic companies. And the question was in that particular webinar how to deal with those uh, threats. Um, and today we will see one particular <coughs> way to deal with those things, which is called uh, in license uh, uh, IPR. So uh, we are talking again, like you see right now, about dramatic changes in the pharmaceutical industry. Of course, the patent claim when current pipeline is not able to compensate for uh, their losses. And in these particular cases, companies are fined, are seeking for cheaper alternatives and new business models like outsourcing, M&A, and of course our subject, uh, the in-license. Um, they're also looking for alternative investment strategies. And of course, it's all about now shifting from also from IP to COGS. In the M&A regard, we should remember that both M&A and in licensing are actually different strategies. You know, you can have in your pharmaceutical company strategy for M&A. You know, I'm saying, you know, I, I can't deal with this patent cliff with all this threat, with all these huge expenses, so I'm just going to do an M&A, and by that solve most of this issue probably. Uh, but again, also a lot of disadvantage in the M&A, of course. And also the licensing, the in-licensing, which we're going to talk about today, this is also a strategy as itself in order to fill pipelines and seek for new uh, promising products. And uh, we will see that this solution maybe uh, could be more appealing and less risky uh, than an M&A. Okay, so we can move uh, to the next uh, slide, please. So, key challenges. What is the best way to maximize value chain productivity? How can pharmaceutical companies minimize their cost? And how can they maximize the opportunity um, of uh, growing uh, markets? Because the main reasons, and you also mentioned that in the previous uh, slide, which you can see, is the lack of recent R&D productivity and pricing pressure in current major markets. And Every company should find main strategies, and again, strategy could be an M&A, could be IPR, uh, in licensing, and could be even more strategies. And we also talk about later stage about difference between generic and innovative in this regard. So main strategies under each one of those three challenges are the main idea here. Then we can move to the next, next slide. Now, I think this structure really, really, really speaks for itself. Now, we can see a debilitating that in the traditional strategy, and you know, when we are talking about traditional strategy, with all due respect, this strategy is also taking place right now as we speak. It's not like something, you know, 100 years ago. It's also taking place right now. But because of the problem, risk, and issues with this strategy, we can call it the traditional strategy that has to be changed or really assessed, um, be assessed again. So the traditional strategy, placing big bets on new molecules worked well for shareholders for many years. We also demonstrated that on the first webinar. And the pipeline productivity or the lack of it, which, you know, driving forces in corporate strategic planning. But look at the third, third bullet. Industry, I mean pharmaceutical industry, spending R&D between 2002 to 2011, 1.1 trillion dollars. This is actually unbelievable, only on R&D. And we can see the structure. We can see the structure to the right side, and we can see R&D spending goes much more and more and more. And that explains the market. But look what happened to the M&E, the new chemical or prescription therapeutic. And you can see all about it. That they are going down and down and down. This is almost becoming the opposite. And that's why the old traditional strategy hasn't been providing any promising result. And again, I think this graph really speaks for itself. And I think every company knows that even without uh, the graph. So let's move to the next slide, please. All right, we can move to the next slide, but uh, uh, while we are moving to the next slide, um, I would like just uh, uh, to mention, you know, we also uh, placed an article about that uh, in our uh, 
in our website, when you can go into the TPA website and you can look uh, at the several articles, this is actually the second article, and before uh, we have every before each webinar we'll have, we'll place an article dedicated summary, probably summary of the last of the previous webinar, and then also uh, give some uh, teasers and hints uh, for the next webinar. And we're also going to place um, several more articles because this is really fascinating. So we place an article about this IPR, and this, you know, we wrote there, and 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 and, and this is very important to know because this new reality we're just talking about right now really drives the pharmaceutical industry to face the sharpest revenue decline in history. And we just saw that in the graph, and we saw the spending and increased fierce price competition from generics, which also concerned about balancing, of course, and then those resulting decline are reducing expenditure and productivity. And in order to keep up with all those future pace and improve the R&D productivity while reducing those costs and establishing a good position in the emerging markets and also dictate innovation and future trends, you know, pharmaceutical companies need to act in two parallel strategies. First, to augmenting their product pipeline by both developing drugs on their own, and we discussed this also in the first webinar, and in collaboration with different organizations in various development stages, second, reducing the risks and the expenditure costs. So this is, in fact, what in licensing is all about. One of the possible approaches that we just discussed in collaborating with various uh, and, 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 and improve R&D and things like that from university, for example. We're going to talk about laboratories, startups, biotech companies, this is the way of in licensing. And these alliances actually enable companies to operate as independent tendencies and to avoid complex merger and acquisition. You know, again, and that also a strategy, again, M&A. But, you know, a lot of companies trying to avoid that. A lot of huge pharmaceutical companies, when they had on their strategies M&A, now changing their strategy while continuing to form platform for innovation. And furthermore, with respect to what we said right now, the in-licensing and the collaboration agreement frequently involves competitors or at least potential competitors, and that means that the ability of large pharmaceutical companies monitoring the competition and entering the market of generic companies is increased. So what is this in-licensing? And you can see the definition in the right uh, side of the slide. Now, this hasn't been taken from a dictionary or from uh, any website or from anything. This is the way we see the definition of in license. You can, of course, agree to that or disagree, but you know, this is the way we see it. In licensing is a partnership in the end of the day that develops between two companies that have shared intentions, goals, or fields of interest and resources. You know, resources could be IP, know how, uh, laboratories, and a lot of more issues. And this form of collaboration is characterized by a mutual nature rather than one-sided license. And in the case of pharmaceutical companies, which that's the reason we are here right now, these goals can be the R&D of a product or perhaps the manufacturing distribution or marketing. And we're going to speak in this regard, of course, generally speaking with all the slides, but when we are saying partnership between two companies, what happens if those two companies are related? What are the transfer pricing consequences, opportunities, and risk of such a partnership? So um, <clears throat> we can see there is a focus shift from actively managing entire value chain and, you know, to outsourcing a number of activities. And a lot of challenges faced by pharmaceutical companies we just discussed. We don't have to repeat anymore. But we know that big pharma are looking for new models that will allow them to handle their current challenges. And we see the definition of the in-licensing IPR. And the last slide, we also give some examples from recent news. But let me elaborate right now. Um, we just heard that a company called Morphosis signs global license agreement with GSK for anti-inflammatory program. And GSK will assume responsibility for all subsequent development and commercialization of that product. And a part of that agreement that they made together, Morphosis receives an immediate front payment of 22.5 million euro. 
on achievement of certain developmental issues, and moreover would be eligible to receive additional payments from GSK of up to 423, 423 million euro in addition to tier double debt royalties on our sales. So that is a great news and great opportunity, of course, for Morpho. But that's also a certain strategy of GSK to perform an IPR in license with another company. And we're going to see a lot of examples in that. And this is taking place right now um, a lot. And we can move uh, to the next slide, please. Okay, so we are talking <coughs> about moving to new business models. We have the shift from maintaining own in-house R&D resources to creating strategies, alliances, like from biotechnologists, we just saw an example, laboratories, universities, and things like that. And then the patent cliff, you know, patent cliff in the last webinar, and also today seems to be a very risky, a very curse and threatening stuff over company, but maybe it could be also an opportunity. You know, I wrote a blessing. Maybe I'm over-exaggerating, but maybe also an opportunity. Because if you, uh, you realize, you know, the pharmaceutical company realize that it certainly has a patent cliff uh, issue, then maybe this patent cliff can give this company a new vision for its supply chain using those in license uh, IPR. Uh, not staying on a fixed place and on a, on a fixed situation. Um, looking for other developments through other companies, maybe related companies, that weren't uh, uh, exist anymore. And by a proper transfer pricing planning, if we are talking about, um, about related companies, also you know, establishing a new R&D institution um, you know, as a separate maybe unit in the legitimate tax plan and find those places when you can get benefit from those R&D and put them in your R&D uh, planning in transfer pricing. And if we're looking about uh, motivation, you know, we can see here that we are maximizing financial returns and uh, obtaining new products and monitoring competition and more and more. We can say also expanding portfolio because in-licensing products can drive revenues of existing in-house products, and that's very important. Um, I would like also to address uh, in this slide specifically to Stef, and uh, here also his input, please. Thanks, Sharif. Uh, there's, a, there's a few observations here. If you see uh, that uh, large, um, uh, large pharma companies are outsourcing or phasing out their own R&D to be replaced by um, in-licensing, and the question is a little bit, what are, what are the margin consequences? Are they really uh, outsourcing uh, only the activity, which means that the cost and the, the, the risk uh, probably stay on board? Or are they also able to um, mitigate the, the cost and the risk involved uh, on top of that outsourced activity uh, of doing the research? And so the question is, are universities really ready to absorb these costs and risk, risks attached to the R&D function? Um, if they are, there are certain consequences uh, from a transfer pricing perspective. And the consequences are that you would need some degree of funding by the pharma companies on that licensing you would um, need to agree very precisely what risk is, is being shifted, like uh, the example here, if you just gave on the, in, in the marketplace uh, uh, with Glaxo. And uh, the, the question then is, who gets what part of the margin once uh, those, uh, those results go live in the, to the marketplace? So it, it does create some, some questions, and it almost seems like if you're able to move the activity wholly or partially, you are sharing the cost, uh, at least the big pharma is contributing some level of cost uh, to the university from which it, it uh, intends to in-license, and you're also able to share some of the risks, uh, this collaborative model uh, runs into uh, the direction of a cost-sharing type of arrangement, uh, with, uh, with which we've been seeing um, across the globe within the big pharma companies between their 
major R&D hubs. So I think that's, uh, that's an important uh, set of transfer-pricing consequences. Um, on, the, on the patent cliff, that's the second topic uh, here, uh, there is a, a question, um, if the patent cliff happens, what is then the returns on, on the R&D function? Uh, had as a function where uh, I, I believe we gave an example in our first uh, webinar where uh, India courts did not honor a certain file patent. So you you don't have uh, that legal protection anymore. Uh, then the question next, if you are in that patent cliff, who's then going to be building the global or the product specific brands uh, and and you you're from a transpricing perspective stepping into an area which might be even more trickier than the legal protection you get for patents, and that is the discussion. Uh, for example, China does not accept uh, a brand ownership of a non-Chinese company if if the brand the branding of the product uh, is made specific for the Chinese marketplace. So. Yes, you could turn something into uh, from a, 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 an ethical drug to a brand that's generic, but who's going to pay for the build up, building up the brand if the brand is uh, is made Chinese specific? So here we we see a lot of uh, dilemmas coming uh, coming not only from a pure business model perspective, but also from a, a transpricing perspective. Thank you, Steph. I think uh, you're absolutely right, and I think a cost-sharing arrangement, you know, whether it's between third parties and also uh, related companies, which we are seeing a lot of today, is uh, a very major key aspect in this regard. We're going to talk about it in a couple of slides, and also uh, once we come uh, uh, near the end uh, of this uh, webinar. Um, and uh, all right, move to the next uh, slide, please. All right, we are seeing here the traditional, again, when I'm talking about traditional, that doesn't mean that's something that we're not facing anymore, but again, the traditional pharmaceutical operation uh, when the one pharma company, you know, is doing the pharmaceutical and R&D, and then in the right side, we are seeing the new pharmaceutical operation of the license, in licensing of biotech companies, universities, and also uh, uh, laboratories. Um, and we are facing a lot of, you know, uh, we are facing personally in TPA, um, I will give an example, we are seeing collaboration between industry universities which are promoted by open innovation programs which have become a near universal model for R&D. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies offer university research access to research and funding, because funding here is key aspect, because, you know, the university, with all the respect and those, those small companies, uh, and the GSK, com uh, the example we just uh, uh, seen is a good example for that. Uh, they don't need the fundings to do that, and because, and that question will be uh, whether it's a win-win situation, and the answer is perhaps. Um, because those academic scientists bring in depth expertise and basic research uh, data to the table, and these sometimes not exist in the company. And open innovation has exploded into mega partnership of academia, industry, government, agencies. We have a very good example, you know, Teva Pharmaceutical, the larger generic pharmaceutical company in the world, has one blockbuster of, of innovative products. So Teva is a generic company, famous for its generic pharmaceutical products, but also developed a couple of innovative products. One of them is the Copaxone for Maltolis crasis, and the other one is uh, called Rasagilin, and that is for Parkinson. This is uh, Teva's product, and Teva is always uh, using the patent cliff, you know, to get the patent, and by the way, do it very well. You can't argue with its success is going to face attack from the other side. This is kind of ironic because other uh, generic pharmaceuticals and also innovative pharmaceuticals will try and are trying today to attack uh, Tevas, uh, those innovative products, and, uh, and try to manufacture it for themselves uh, as branded uh, generics and generics. But the Copaxone, this blockbuster innovative of Teva, was actually a collaboration 
between the Weizmann Institute in Israel, which is, of course, a university, a very, very world-known university for science, and Teva, when Teva funded all this research, and it had never been able to do it alone because a couple of people there, which one of them I know personally, Professor Michael Sella, who invented those Copaxon, entered into a in-licensed IPR with Teva, and in the end of the day, uh, received certain royalties until today, and Teva actually created without its huge uh, blockbusters. And we have also other uh, 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 examples, like for example, in August 2012, Novartis and the University of Pennsylvania entered a five-year global collaboration to research, develop, and commercialize target Climeric uh, antigen receptor and also uh, other examples. So big pharmaceutical companies are intent to buy drugs from smaller biotech companies. Researchers in these smaller companies create drugs which are still in the experimental stages, but then they get the funding they need, and then they continue to do so, and maybe this is a win-win <coughs> situation. We have to remember that in a certain point of time, a lot of those uh, small biotech companies are being, in the end of the day, merged into those pharmaceutical companies, but they are not merged all the time in the first scenario when they're starting to work together, but rather than when, you know, when they are creating their next blockbuster or they are in clinical trials or in, uh, in something else, then they are becoming merged and then they are related and there is, of course, a very huge transfer pricing issues uh, that uh, those companies need uh, to settle. Um, I just want to say about this uh, slide that the, this is generally related to innovative R&D. We have to remember, it's very important because that's also got a lot of transfer pricing consequences. We have to remember that there's a big difference between generics R&D and innovative R&D because in generics R&D, only the bio studies, the bio studies are needed and when innovative pharma, where, where they are also required clinical trials, and all the R&D period is much, much longer. And that has, of course, major consequences on all these patent lease issues and R&D expenditure and in licensing IPR, and in the end of the day, um, about the ability uh, to do whatever you need uh, to do. Um, let's move uh, to the next slide, please. Okay, so... Uh, we can see here again uh, the traditional fully integrated pharmaceutical company, and on the right side, the collaborative, collaborative pharmaceutical uh, network. So I think it speaks for itself. We can read it. Um, the question is whether we maintain the R&D within the company or we outsource that. We also discussed this in the first webinar of the patent claim that many companies today are using uh, a clinical research organization like CRO uh, to do their clinical trials, pharmaceutical companies. Um, and that could be, of course, also within the company, you know, that you are engaged uh, your other related party or establish a related party that will do that and then you need to do a transfer pricing study in order, like we're doing many like that before, uh, like right, right now, in order to establish what would be the arm length remuneration of those uh, clinical trials. So uh, regarding those patent clips and everything, those companies uh, need to decide whether to keep the R&D in-house or externally and what would be uh, uh, the time, whether uh, the strategy would be a long term or a short term. Um, uh, Steph, I uh, would appreciate also your comments here, please. I think the, uh, the what, what we're looking at here in the picture is uh, if you look at fully integrated to a collaborative uh, network, which is, uh, I, I, I think, funny you'd say that, Yariv, that maybe. Uh, Companies like Eva are, are also moving to collaborative uh, networks. So uh, rather than the big pharma moving to a new earnings model, it, it might be a, a big happy meeting uh, in, in uh, each other in the, in, in the, in the middle, uh, where where everyone is slowly but gradually moving to collaborative uh, pharmaceutical network uh, in the in the not so far future. Um, the observation, if you look at these two pictures, it, it almost looks like uh, the situation uh, before and after a business restructuring. So the, the transposing discussion here is uh, if you 
done it always uh, the way the left part of this uh, picture is showing as a, a fully integrated pharmaceutical company. And now you're going, by virtue of moving to a new earnings model, you're going to shift functions, risks, and assets around. And, and that means you need to get rid of certain assets, like maybe you're, you have a big um, laboratory in Europe who you want to get rid of because you are replacing that with, uh, with the uh, in licensing uh, and, and collaborative networks uh, with the universities. That uh, creates a big shift of functions, risks, and assets around the globe. Uh, or in a particular region. Um, as we all know, tax inspectors are quite sensitive to it. So if you move, say, a laboratory and you close it down in one country and uh, suddenly you're, you're using a lot of universities around the planet uh, on, on this in-licensing uh, model, it, it seems like you're also not only shifting contracts but also functions, r risks, and assets are being moved around. Um, the threat side of this is that tax authorities say you're really shifting valuable assets um, and therefore you, you, you will have to recognize a capital gain as part of the business restructuring because you're also changing the contractual setup. Um, the other side of looking at it is it's loaded with opportunities because you know there's going to be some phase out on profitability of your existing operations uh, and you can do a new planning um, on your new business configuration, uh, or including the, uh, the optimization of uh, IP and the location of the IP. Thank you, Stef. And I think restructuring is indeed a key aspect in this regard. You know, restructuring has been always, not always, you know, for the last years, one of the OECDs, our uh, transfer pricing regulation, most uh, uh, interesting thing uh, as long in the force connected uh, to all the revision in intangibles. Um, and in this regard, it's also very important to remember that once you are indeed doing restructuring because you are in licensing IPR and such, there's also consequences in transfer pricing. You know, like I said, you tax the torture or saying you're moving an asset. So that has also consequences uh, of reputation, for example, an inventory question. And low and shifting from low risk to full risk distributors, vice versa, changing your service uh, uh, cost, uh, and also starting maybe charge royalties, as we can see right now. And uh, we are facing a lot of transfer pricing work for pharmaceutical companies globally right now that we're involved in. That uh, you know we are doing those is in license IPR within uh, the group, um, but that immediately raises issues like you just mentioned, Steph about the restructuring, which also has to be dealt uh, within uh, the transfer uh, pricing uh, uh, handling. All right. Uh, thank you. We can move, uh, please, to the next uh, slide. Okay. So let's start uh, talking about uh, these uh, actual examples. And again, everything we are saying right now is uh, basically could be between third parties you know, where you engaged uh, universities, laboratories, uh, institutions, and things like that. Um, and naturally, naturally, um, and in many cases that we are seeing, this is happening uh, also uh, within the group. And of course, like I mentioned before, sometimes a certain pharmaceutical company uh, is in licensing IPR with another uh, third-party uh, company, uh, but in the end of the day, uh, in a certain stage, they're also merged uh, to each other or a buyer or something like that. So the typical license agreement today, um, a lot of transfer pricing studies deal with that, is that we have the licensor. So let's say we have a certain party, which is the licensor, and it grants a license for its related party uh, in another country. And the license is for manufacturing and sell the product, so the IP. Um, uh, legally, maybe economically, that's also a big uh, issue today. The IP uh, belongs uh, to the licensor, the IP holder, um, but company B is manufacturing and sell the product. This is a classic license 
transaction when we are doing a lot of transfer pricing studies for that. It's like if someone from uh, a side objective would come and check company number B, it will realize it manufacture and sells the product. It would probably think that the IP belongs to company B. The truth is, of course, it belongs to company A, and that's why company B needs to pay probably royalties, for example, uh, to uh, company A. And then we are doing, of course, the transfer pricing studies when we can have, of course, uh, the valuation uh, method when we are doing, uh, for example, DCF or real option plan. We're going to discuss that uh, in the final webinar, uh, the difference between uh, those uh, uh, two. Uh, or we are uh, doing what we call in transfer pricing the marketing approach when we are uh, entering databases and uh, we are looking at uh, try to find similar agreements with facts and circumstances as lawyers we are also specializing uh, on doing that and then we are determined what would be a certain royalty uh, rate or a lump sum payment or whatever so this is the typical <coughs> license agreement when we are talking about an in licensing agreement you can see the triangle right now when you know the new ip is combined between company a and company b in this regard, this is something completely new, which according to our experience also involves even, believe it or not, psychological aspects of who owns most of the IP and things like that. But in the end of the day, and Steph, you mentioned that, um, there is issue here about cost allocation and profit split. So when we are talking about transfer pricing in this regard, so in cost allocation, arrangement you know both party has uh, w both parties in this regard have one intention to develop something together and to split the course their cost on respectively of who's doing what allocate that uh, in this regard and and this is a very typical and very uh, uh, um, known arrangement today which has a lot of sponsor pricing impact uh, and the issue in this regard. But one of the best benefits of where you're doing cost allocation uh, uh, together with another related party, for example, is that you're exempt for royalties because you are developing together and you are allocating your expense and, and this is not a license to one each other. It's an in-licensing joint agreement. Therefore, you can avoid, for example, withholding tax. It also has a lot of disadvantage and things like that. But when you're doing a cost allocation in licensing agreement um, in a related party, this is a transfer pricing issue that needs to be handled. The other thing is profit split. Profit split is a very known and complex method of transfer pricing. When two companies are developing together, like you know, what you just discussed, the cost allocation process, when they're doing that in the end of the day, they would like to know how they profit would be split between the two companies who owns jointly the the uh, the IP, and uh, in this regard, this is a very ex extensive and uh, uh, I would say a complicated analysis that we, uh, surprisingly or not, are facing in the last couple of years, and also and I would say with a lot of uh, pharmaceutical. Uh, uh, companies, which makes, here, makes it, of course, even uh, uh, complicated. Because in a profit split analysis, uh, we are, uh, what's the method of the profit split? We are trying to see uh, what is the routine activities that the two parties are doing with each other. For example, one party is distributing the other party's product, services, royalties, whatever. But then we come to the intangibles. And when we are looking at the non-routine issues of the companies, after we are allocating the routine profit, we must find what would be the non-routine profit according to the actual uh, performing and contribution to this developed IP. And once we are doing that, we are using techniques like the DCF and valuation and uh, a lot of financial issues uh, and techniques in the end of the day, to say, all right, those two companies in licensing agreement developed the IP, and now 40% of the profit belongs to company A, and 60% of the, of the profit belongs to company B, and everything, of course, must be documented and explained in the transfer pricing studies and in an agreement. And by the way, also, this could be, we had a very interesting uh, uh, case uh, in New York, about two companies that entering such a thing before a couple of years, and you know they are not making money 
they are losing money. The whole group is losing money in this regard. And the interesting question in this regard is how to allocate not only the profit, but also how to allocate uh, the loss. So um, in related parties, but also in third parties, this profit split technique, although quite complex, could be uh, uh, proven to be uh, achieving uh, very nice uh, results. Uh, Steph, would you like to uh, comment about that? Yeah, two comments. Uh, if you move from uh, the left uh, mo uh, model, uh, which is uh, the, the whole ownership of the IP rests with the IP holder, uh, you would expect that IP holder to sort of get a royalty rate, which uh, depending on the, on the, the type of, uh, of, uh, of patents we're looking at, and would be between 5 15 percent of sales at the level of the licensee. Uh, when you move to the in-licensing agreement type of model, obviously a portion of that licensing income revenue you need to be splitting with, uh, with the one who's taken over some of the activities, risks, and maybe also cost, uh, cost relating to R&D. So it will... Uh, inevitably cr create some erosion of your licensing income, which has been the main source for uh, for, for big pharma companies. Uh, so that's one observation. The second observation is that uh, tax authorities uh, are reconsidering how how these old models of compensating the IP owner, IP holder works. So they they're basically saying uh, in the old uh, model, you could look at the licensee and give the licensee a, a relatively um, low uh, operating margin and assume all the excessive margin on top of that routine was uh, locked into the legal ownership of the IP at the level of the IP holder. Tax authorities are stepping away from that model, which is uh, called an implied royalty rate mo model. Um, and that means that uh, the, the tendency of tax authorities to challenge you on, on uh, high royalty rates, which only leave a routine margin at the level of the licensee, are uh, happening on a daily basis now. And that, that also means that tax authorities under the old model are moving, migrating more to a profit split type of uh, approach. <laughs> Uh, again, uh, the, uh, the, the the new model will change that picture again because not the whole income will be loaded on the on, on at the level of the IP holder because it will have to share it with uh, the uh, universities or the other institutes taking over some some of these functions. And Steph, do you would you recommend maybe because we've written these cases like this, uh, you know when. Uh, uh, one company is working with a third party um, to use maybe transfer pricing techniques in order to also uh, to try to come to the market uh, price. What do you think about that? I think certainly transfer pricing techniques and what uh, what the whole um, licensing income um, used to be in the in the old days uh, is uh, could be a reference point. I think, however, that uh, since uh, successful output out of R&D becomes more and more expensive. You might also argue that uh, the old transpricing references, as in the 5 to 15% royalty rates I was referring to, are mm -hmm. uh, underpricing future, the, the results, uh, successful result of future R&D, uh, because it's very hard to get a good uh, good result out of R&D. That's what your initial picture showed, Yariv. And that means maybe in the in the future, uh, the royalty rates uh, will will be uh, a staggering 30 to f even 50 percent because there's a scarcity of uh, of successful R&D uh, um, uh, results in in the marketplace. Yes, I I, I agree on that, and I, I can t I can add to that that we are recently saw some cases in the court when we also were asked uh, to give an expert opinion, when the court uh, also would uh, ask, the, you know, the company did the transfer pricing study, like you said, 
um, marketing approach, databases, and then gave a range of uh, 3% to 7% royalties uh, out, of, uh, out of revenues. And then the court said that with all due respect, in this particular scenario of licensing, of huge R&Ds and things like that, uh, even the court says you would be expected to do a certain valuation, even a simple DCF, but still uh, not. And, and surprisingly or not, uh, when we did such valuation a couple of times, the results were actually higher royalty rates that I think that's very connected uh, uh, to what uh, you said uh, right now. So uh, thank you. Okay, let's, uh, let's move to the next slide, please. All right, so the main issue here, again, is the, who is the owner of uh, the IP, because defining this ownership of IP developed through in-licensing agreements raises questions like what would be the transfer pricing challenges and uh, consequences, because we are witnessing more and more licenses R&D agreement with specialty shop universities, like you said, and in the process of structuring those in license IPR, the multinationals, they are keen to prefer creation of sometimes centralized IP hubs or principal structure, which also raises uh, transfer pricing uh, uh, question about restructuring and about uh, new uh, services uh, and uh, transaction. Any comments on that, Steph? Uh, no, not at this point. Uh yeah, okay. So uh, we will uh, move to the next slide. Oh, uh, you, you know, there's a, there's an issue here, which uh, if, if you look at the ownership, uh, ownership is uh, right pretty narrow, uh, as in ownership from an I, IP law, so an intellectual property uh, law perspective. I, I think that's where a lot of the discussion is is sort of. Uh, more difficult. If you talk to tax and transpricing people, they they do recognize, and that that, that was uh, that, that's certainly becoming the case in the, in licensing that the university might be the legal owner of the um, mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, uh, the patent uh, from an IP law perspective, but the uh, in licensed uh, uh, party, the pharma company, might be the economic owner. Uh, exploiting the, uh, the, the the patents uh, in the, in the marketplace, then the the third definition of ownership is in whose name are these patents registered in the in the marketplace uh, to to be protected uh, against uh, other parties in the market. So that's almost like a third definition. And typically, I like to add a fourth definition, which is uh, who's the process owner. So who is really in charge of the R&D budget, uh, of the priority of, uh, of these projects, um, and who is also from a, a research perspective in the lead uh, of, of driving the uh, results of the R&D to a, a, an as high output as, uh, as uh, possible. So that's the process owner uh, is, for transfer pricing purposes, also a relevant reference. Thank you. I, I think that was a very good point, and I, I'm glad you raised that because, uh, as we see today, the tax authorities, um, you know, uh, a lot of companies register their IP in a certain call it the legal ownership, and then the tax authorities. And we are seeing what's happened with Apple right now, and we have a lot of examples like IKEA, Google, Facebook, and such. You know, and pharmaceuticals are always abused in court uh, in India, in the state, GSK, whatever. You know, a lot of companies. And in the end of the day, today, there is the really argument between the legal ownership and the economic ownership. So they think in this regard, in the in-license and all this collaboration, that makes it even uh, broader and even uh, complicated uh, and a very uh, serious transfer pricing aspect. Okay, let's, let's move. Thank you for, for the next, uh, uh, to the next slide, please. All right, so what are the costs? We have the tight uh, credit that force pharmaceutical companies to develop cost reduction strategies, the short term and the long term uh, issues. And I would like to just like to, I think it speaks for itself, I just, just like to add that one of the big key areas of cost reduction, which I personally witness in pharmaceutical companies, is the procurement. A lot of pharmaceutical companies today, when they're restructuring, they're building one procurement center. Who is entitled? Who is uh, in charge 
of uh, you know buying and dealing with those raw materials for API approved prescription um, and for uh, the pharmaceutical uh, itself. And uh, this also must be, of course, regarded as a certain DP issue. How to compensate this service both for the price he paid uh, for buying those materials and also. Um, uh, for doing that service, because if we compare that to a third party, you would be expect a certain compensation. So that's a very thing that we, a very large thing we see nowadays in pharmaceutical procurement issues, logistic uh, services, and TP issues. All that we can move on. So, what are the most common strategies in the short time quick cost cutting? Uh, will it deliver the R and D? Will deliver anticipated return? And the long-term investment in own R&D versus outsourcing. We discussed this, um, and that will always be an issue. We can move on. Now, of course, with every opportunity, also we are facing risks and transfer pricing risks. Asset, like intangible and functions, are always the key issues of all transfer pricing report and also intercompany transactions. First of all, um, you know, there's the principle of the permanent establishment. Permanent establishment, I'm sure everybody knows about it. Uh, um, by the way, uh, cost allocation uh, service, cost allocation arrangement have been identified as the OECD for not creating any permanent establishment between the companies if they are doing uh, properly, which makes it very critical to do that properly. Um, basically, you want to avoid permanent establishments which can create a double uh, taxation, as you can see in the second bulleting. And of course, there is a potential for permanent establishment, for right to use name, for a right of use of a certain product uh, on behalf of the company. A lot of the issues, uh, you know, permanent establishment is a whole webinar by itself and even a couple of webinars. Um, you want to uh, keep doing your transfer pricing and situate transfer pricing, uh, which is monitored and planned and uh, documented right, is actually one of the main medicine um, to, uh, to prevent permanent establishment. Um, transfer pricing, again, transfer pricing, of course, a risk by itself. Everything needs to be documented. Otherwise, we are facing uh, lines, double taxations, uh, uh, and uh, also liabilities on uh, on many managers and uh, things like that, so you have to do it right and accepted by tax authorities, uh, with all the acts we discussed. And uh, also, we are facing a couple of countries now. I'm sure around the world, the antitrust issue, because when you are, for example, in licensing uh, with a biotech company, for example, or a certain laboratory or something in another country, like with the example we gave with GK, this particular company who was a certain player in a multiple player game in that certain country has suddenly become very powerful. It, you know, it achieved large funds, it's now very hard, very strong, marketing new things with the pharmaceutical company uh, that stands behind there, and that can affect the prices in those particular markets, but also can hurt hurt the supply chains, you know, at a certain point maybe some product cannot be delivered as before, maybe new product entering, and that cause, we have one example in Israel, that cause a certain antitrust issue um, when you need also to solve. Okay, we can move. So some alliances involve multiple entities. We just gave examples. Track levels of profit sharing and dissimilar particular rights between the parties. You need to handle all that, whether it's related or not related. If it's related, of course, transfer pricing is the key aspect. And transfer pricing for pharmaceutical is not the routine transfer pricing for other companies. You can trust us about that. And involvement of pharmaceutical companies in numerous collaboration in several areas of business and allows them measuring their respective contribution, and again, especially the IP, the legal ownership, versus the economic, and also allocating the income accordingly will be an enormous undertaking again and again and again. Transfer pricing in the question will be who got what portion of the pie, and what transfer pricing, we just discussed, the evaluation methods can help, because also in valuation we can face a couple of methods and what would be the right method for you. Let's move on. 
Regarding financial aspects, so naturally the benefits, and we discussed this also in the first webinar, is reduce initial capital outlay and convert portion to fixed cost to variable cost. We talked about uh, moving uh, from uh, R&D uh, to COGS and enable flexibility. Um, and then the payments for further research undertaken by the licensor. Again, limited resources loans, purchasing equity as the licensor and convertible loans, these are all assist and have also a must think, must think when uh, we are dealing with this in license IPR. Um, but we have to remember that when we are talking about related pharmaceutical companies or companies that will be related in the end of the day, all these financial transactions are seems to be forgotten. A lot of advisors, a lot of um, companies forget that intercompany finance is also a major and a huge transfer pricing issue. We have a special team in TPA that are dealing with that, and we just released a special playbook about that. These uh, financial issues in transfer pricing need to be also taken care of. I wrote there ESOP, that's the options, uh, employee stock option plan. I will just say a couple of words about it very shortly. You know that uh, in the United States, uh, we, uh, there, there was a verdict called violence about a certain company that entered the cost allocation uh, uh, arrangement with another company, which, which is, of course, a related party in Ireland. And in the end of the day, uh, these lilings in the United States granted options to the employee of its subsidiary in Ireland. And when they were doing their cost allocation, the IRS came and said, uh, you know what, uh, with all due respect, also in Ireland, you should also include your option expenses, whether it's the plans, whether it's the advisor are doing the options, everything that has to do with the options plan has to be entered inside the cost allocation. And that's a, that allowed a major tax consequences today because in Israel right now, for example, we are involved of three major court cases out of four that are taking place when the Israeli tax authority are saying to a certain Israeli company who is as a parent in the U.S. that when they are doing cost plus, this is a pharmaceutical company, when they are receiving uh, cost plus from their parent in the U.S. and when they were granted options from their parent in the U.S., they have certain costs related to those options and those costs are 100% connected to the R&D service they provide and therefore there should have been as part of the cost and taxed accordingly. So these financial aspects also have to be taken into consideration and about uh, transfer pricing. Let's move on. Please. So uh, threats, risks, that's the same thing, consequences, um, where you see that tax executive will play a strategic role, they are already good and playing a strategic role uh, in appropriate uh, managing uh, transfer pricing their risks, and uh, of course significant the tax consequences. Uh, we talk about restructuring. We talked about the challenge of assessing value difference, upfront definition of measurable components, and also the the threats of losing control on supply chain don't want in your pharmaceutical company to lose control and supply uh, uh, chain because of a not a good planning of an uh, in-license IPR. This can be also be solved by using transfer pricing. Let's move on. And again, the opportunity is very important. We have the size advantage that becoming legible and each player in the pharmaceutical industry, whether it is pharma, biotech laboratories, university clinic hospital, can build specific area expertise. We are calling it in our transfer pricing language and also in business language, centers of excellence um, uh, that we can see many advantage uh, of them, of course, improving uh, in performance and the in-house versus uh, the outsource. We discussed this a lot and we'll continue to discuss this in the next webinars. Um, and a third-party alliance can provide a wider range of opportunities, especially skills and market access. But of course, 
Um, we also have to take into consideration that many of these cases are, in the end of the day, related companies. And then again, transfer pricing become a huge aspect. Let's move on. Okay, so we mentioned a couple of examples. Steph, you mentioned a couple of examples, and I think I gave also a real example uh, um, from uh, the last, uh, uh, from the, you know, the previous weeks uh, and months. Um, so if you're looking at that, what we're we looking about AstraZeneca, like in licensing and acquisitioning. Uh, we look about focusing on small and mid-sized deals. Sanofi, Teva. Look about uh, bulletin number uh, four or number two in the right side. Uh, uh, this was just uh, right now. Uh, this is you know this is fresh, fresh from today, from an Israeli newspaper, a very famous one called Globes, uh, when it says that AstraZeneca, we mentioned that company a lot, is to bid with uh, Takeda for Israeli biotech incubator. We mentioned those incubator techniques and advantage uh, the first uh, webinars. And AstraZeneca is to bid with Takeda for Israel Biotech Incubator. That's a classic in licensing IDR. And AstraZeneca and Japan's Tadeka will bid against Johnson & Johnson. So that's, again, this is strategy how to compete against your uh, uh, competitors. Um, and this, uh, surprisingly or not, and we didn't plan it uh, uh, before, uh, it's now 6 o'clock uh, in Israel and 5 o'clock uh, um, in Europe, brings us uh, to the last slide before uh, uh, any question uh, that uh, you may have. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, please free uh, to ask them now or to send them to them. Um, anyhow, this, I guess, uh, like the first webinar, this webinar will go live. Um, this live webinar will go uh, on the multimedia. We need to hear it every, over again and again, if you like, um, on our TPA website. You can also read uh, articles there. Also, you can listen to the first webinar about patent clip. You know, these webinars are really 100% connected to each other. And uh, you can, of course, also see the presentation there. Um, and are there any questions? Well, maybe a quick question uh, from my end, Thierry. Uh, how do you see, how quickly do you see this uh, in licensing is going to replace the own R&D efforts by these big pharma companies? Because there might not be sufficient sources of or universities around to actually take uh, take the volume jobs on, on R and D. Well that's a very good question. From what I'm experiencing right now, um, I still see a lot of opportunities and a lot of uh, arrangement and deals uh, with uh, big pharma companies and universities. But as we are moving uh, forward again and again, what we are witnessing right now is actually less universities and more biotech companies uh, that becomes related parties and also a vast restructuring uh, like we said in this webinar, webinar in order to be prepared for every threat uh, the company may have. So uh, we are seeing a lot of related party transactions or future related party transactions uh, with a lot of uh, startup companies, biotech companies, laboratories, and also a restructuring of companies within the group. Thank you.